ready to get started for the next session with Matt? Okay. I want to first uh, pick up where we left off at the very end last time and just say a couple more remarks about, about flux quantization. Um, then we're going to move on and talk about uh, instanton number for abelian and non-abelian gauge fields and, and about the chiral anomaly and hopefully at the end of the lecture about the strong CP problem. So basically this lecture is all sort of setting up like the basic ingredients you need to know to understand what axions are and what they do. And then next time we're going to talk in a lot more detail about models of axions and how they work. Okay, so, so this lecture is more kind of field theory basics, but, but next time this will turn into specific beyond the standard model, model building. Okay, so last time I told you that magnetic flux is quantized. So the integral of f over a two-dimensional surface divided by two pi is an integer. Um, and what I was emphasizing at the end was this is valid for all configurations in the path integral. This is a topological constraint. Um, an example that I'm not going to talk about in detail, but some of you may have seen before, is the Dirac monopole. So there's a magnetic monopole, which is like a singular point in the middle here. And there's a magnetic flux that comes out of this monopole. And the reason there's a topology hidden here is if you want to describe this in terms of a gauge field, you find that you can't have a gauge field configuration that's valid everywhere. It has to be singular somewhere. So one thing you can do is you can define a gauge field configuration kind of in the northern region of the sphere. You can define a different gauge field configuration in the southern region of the sphere, but the southern gauge field doesn't get all the way to the north pole, and the northern gauge field doesn't get all the way to the south pole. If you tried to extend them, they would become singular. But they describe the same underlying field because they're gauge equivalent to each other. So what you can do is find a gauge transformation in the overlap region that turns one into the other. But the interesting thing is that gauge configuration, you need to do that. The, the gauge transformation parameter alpha has a non-trivial winding around the circle that goes around uh, the equator of the sphere. Okay. So we keep seeing this kind of winding, and I'm going to show you another example in, in a minute where there's winding. Um, I don't want to talk about monopoles in detail. I really don't have time. I just wanted to mention it because some of you may, may have seen it before. And I want to contrast this with the quantization of electric flux. So electric flux is also quantized because we said that electric charge is quantized, right? U1 charge is quantized. If I have an electron, I can measure the electric field in a, in a sphere around it. But it turns out this is a different kind of thing. This is not topological. The gauge field outside the electron makes sense everywhere. You can just solve your classical equation of motion and find a gauge field. Um, and in fact, the form of this quantization condition depends on the equations of motion of the theory. So if I just had free electromagnetism, I would get a conservation. Uh, I would get a quantization law like this, 1 over e squared integral star f is an integer. Um, if I have extra stuff in my Lagrangian, like f mu nu to the fourth terms, or fermions that have dipole moments, other places that f mu nu appears, there will be additional stuff that gets added onto this and corrects it. Okay. So these are very different kinds of things. This law kind of depends just on this differential form f, and it's very simple, uh, but it has this topological nature. This one can be a much more complicated expression that really depends on all the details of the theory, uh, but it's simpler in the sense that it doesn't involve any topology. It's just simple gauge field configurations. Yeah? Do these arguments hold for classical electromagnetism, or does, it only, does this only arise in the quantum? Mechanics? Yeah, these arguments hold in the classical theory. Um, this one certainly does. This is just sort of solving classical equations of motion. Um, this one also, if you allow your classical theory to have these kind of non-trivial topological gauge bundles. Okay. Um, but yeah, when we do the quantum theory, we sum over everything in the path integral. Every field configuration in the path integral obeys this, but not everyone obeys that. Only the ones that are, that are saddle points of the equation in motion. Okay, so this again is kind of like when we had the conservation of the Noether current. It was a, it was a thing that depended on the equations. Okay, and now I want to give you an example. Um, another example with a non-trivial integral of f. And we're going to build on this to talk about something with a non-trivial integral of f wedge f, which is a thing that axions talk to. So that's where we're going. But for now, this is just f again. And so last time I told you that, that I'm just going to define my theories on spaces of non-trivial topology. 
Um, so we can talk about a theory that's defined on a torus. Okay, a torus I can think of as a square where I've identified this edge with that edge and I've identified uh, this edge with that edge. Okay, think of it like an old video game. You go off this side and you come back on over there. Um, and if I actually wrap this up, it would, it would look like you're used to thinking of a torus looking for these two cycles that go around different ways. Okay, so my space is a torus. And I'm going to give it coordinates x1 and x2. They're periodic with period 2 pi r1 and 2 pi r2. And what I want to do is just show you a field configuration where the integral I'm going to call my torus t, the integral of my gauge field, field strength over the torus is 2 pi n. Question? Uh, where does approximately equal? Not oh, that's not approximate. That's, okay. that's like congruent to, like identified oh. with. So I mean it to be stronger than equal, not, not weaker. Yeah. Okay. So I want to find a, a configuration with non-trivial flux of the magnetic field. And so what I could do is just guess that uh, I can find such a thing just by looking at a constant field. Okay, so F1 and 2 here are the indices. Okay, so if I did that, what is my integral? Well, I just integrate over both of these directions, dx1, dx2, f1, 2. So my integral would be 2 pi r1, r2, f1, 2. Okay, so, so what I'm claiming is that only f1, 2 equal to uh, equal to an integer over 2 pi r1, r2 makes sense. Okay, so if I was just writing down an f, I could write down whatever I want. But f is supposed to be the field strength of a gauge field. Okay, so I should be able to look for an a that f is dA. And if my flux quantization law that we derived last time is true, I should only be able to find it for certain special choices of this field strength. Okay. So let's see how that works. Let's try to find an A whose field strength is F. Okay, uh, F is dA, so one guess would be Let's just make A linear in one of our directions. Okay, so let's try A as F12, X1, DX2. That certainly has the right thing. If I take D of A, the D is going to hit this X1 and give me DX1 wedge DX2, and that's going to be the field strength that we were looking for. And what you notice about this is that A is not a well-defined function. So as in the monopole case, somehow we can't, we can't really write down a single valued function A that, that's valid everywhere that will do what we want. If I replace x1 by x1 plus 2 pi r1, I get a different number for A. But that's okay because A is a gauge field. It's not a physical thing. What I need is not that I get a definite number, but that I, if I get two different things, they're related to each other by a gauge transformation. Okay. So here's what we need. We need to be able to find a group element in U1 everywhere on the torus as a function of x1 and x2, such that if I evaluate a when x1 is 2 pi r1, or if I evaluate a when x1 is 0, they're gauge transformations of each other. So that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm just saying as a number, if I plug in f12 times x1, if I plug in 0, I get 0. If I plug in 2 pi r1, I get 2 pi r1 f12. They're not the same number. Um, so I, I've identified these things as spatial coordinates. But just as a function, this is not the same thing. It, it has a different value. Okay. So what we want is to find a gauge transformation that's kind of compatible with this identification that we did on the spatial coordinates. And the thing to guess, this is essentially the same thing we did last time with, with Wilson lines. The thing to guess is that we want something that kind of winds. We, we want our element of u1 that lives on a circle to wrap around this circle. Okay, so we're assigning an element of u1 everywhere here. We want, as we go around the circle here, to go all the way around the u1 circle. Okay, so let's just look at such a thing e to the i alpha x, we're going to take to be e to the i n x2 over r2, where n is an integer. OK, so it's going to wind around the x2 circle. Yeah. Right bigger? OK. Twice as big. OK. Um, OK. OK, so we're writing down this winding gauge transformation. And what does A do? Well, we said A turns into e to the minus i alpha d e to the plus i alpha. Plug this in. You see that the gauge transformation of A shifts A by this amount. OK, we're taking d of something that depended on x2, so we get a dx2. And so our A is going to shift by this. And if I want that to match, I want, I want this gauge transformation to make up for the mismatch between the two values of this with different choices of x1. What I want is that 2 pi r1, f12, dx2, the mismatch that I get here should be something I can compensate by doing this. And so I want this to be equal to n over r2, dx2. What does that mean? That means f12 is n over 2 pi r1 r2. Was there a question? OK. Yeah, uh, I guess it takes a little bit of work to prove that. You, you, you have to, um, yeah, I, I guess what you have to think about is basically that in order to get a non-trivial result, you, you need some topological property like this winding. Um, and, and the winding of u1, the winding of a circle around the circle is always given by some integer. So you can kind of argue it, but um, it would take a little more time to try to make that totally precise. Okay. So, so for now, I, I, I guess what I should say is I, I previously gave you an argument for that. And now what I'm arguing is I'm constructing examples for you of gauge fields that obey that. And your question is, well, how do I tell you there weren't any others that didn't obey that? And, and that I haven't really proven to you, but, but you, you, you could, yeah. It's possible to prove it. I, I just don't want to linger too long on it. OK, so, so we have examples. Uh, there's the monopole, which I didn't talk about in detail, and there's this torus. The interesting thing, thing about the torus is there's no magnetically charged particle here. Our space is just not, it has a non-trivial topology. And the field strength just kind of has a flux that kind of came out of nowhere. It's just, it's a property of the flux itself, of, of the field strength itself rather than a property of some object that's sitting in the space. Um, OK. But that's our example. And, and from this and the Wilson loop last time, hopefully you're getting the flavor that, that all the interesting topology associated with U1 gauge theory comes from the fact that U1 is a circle. Right? So basically, the only thing to do is to look for some circle somewhere that you can wrap it around. 
Um, in the modern hole case, that happens in a little bit of a non-trivial way because our space doesn't have an, a circle in it intrinsically. The monopole puts like a hole in our space, uh, but the circle comes from kind of patching together these two different uh, northern and southern hemispheres. So before we tried to construct the gauge fields on those two, there's no obvious circle to talk about. Okay, but somehow every interesting thing about U1 is going to have some kind of geometric circle that we're somehow wrapping, wrapping our gauge transformation around. Okay, uh, so why am I going through all of this? Uh, partly just because I think it's good for you to know these things. They're basic facts about QFT. Uh, but mainly because we're going to be talking about axions. And what is an axion? Um, let me just go ahead and say kind of my working definition of axion, at least for the purpose of these lectures. Axions are periodic scalar fields. What do I mean by periodic? I mean, if I tell you the field value is theta, or I tell you it's theta plus 2 pi, I mean the same thing. You can't, there's no difference between those. This is really a gauge transformation, a gauge redundancy. We don't usually talk about scalars as gauge fields, but it's a kind of gauge field in that if I tell you some value or I tell you a different value, they're physically the same thing in the same way that two different choices of A related by gauge transformations are the same thing. So my axions are periodic scalar fields um, that, and let me be a little bit vague here, I'll be a little clearer later, that have important couplings to F wedge F for a U1 gauge field or trace of F wedge F for a non-abelian gauge field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm integrating over the whole space, right? So, so, so the question was, the question was before when I talked about the flux, I was integrating over some compact manifold. Here, I'm integrating over the whole space. Yeah. That's right, but the space is is compact. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so my question is, if you're gonna uh, integrate over some sub manifold that is compact, will yeah. you have the same integration? Uh, in this example, um, if I pick a, let's see, what's the way to say this? Um, Because my space here is just two dimensional, there's no closed submanifold without boundary that I can draw that isn't the whole space, right? I could, I could integrate over something like this, but it has a boundary. And, and these arguments assume that there was no boundary. So I wouldn't necessarily get quantization if I did something like that. Do you have a boundary space? If you have a boundary, you can't really say that much. I mean, um, you, you can relate this to the Wilson line around the boundary, but it doesn't have to be quantized anymore. Yeah. Uh, first of all, this first phase, it looks like blood, like it is coming out of the torus into what? Well, here I'm just imagining the whole space is a torus. Um, but we could think about some bigger space that somehow has a torus embedded inside of it. And, and then, then, yeah, then you could imagine doing some experiment where you somehow measure things outside that, that region and see that there was a flux. Yeah. It doesn't have a boundary. It's just, it's just like the surface of the sphere is your is your two dimensional space you integrate over, and so that doesn't have a boundary. That that is a boundary of something, but it doesn't have a boundary itself. Right. So so this is a statement about integrating over any any closed two dimensional surface without a boundary. It it could be the whole space if your space is dimensional. It could be a surface contained in a bigger space. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if we did have some uh, manifold with boundary, would you, is there some generalized version of the Gauss Bernoulli theorem that you could apply to Lie value forms um, to get the same quantization position? Um, I think in general, if we have a boundary, we can't really say a lot. I mean, th there. There are lots of interesting things to say about field theories where we put in boundaries and they're 
degrees of freedom that live on the boundary. Um, but, but I don't think there's any answer I can give to that question quickly <laughs> without, without sort of getting on a big tangent. OK. Um, so I've told you that axions for me are going to be things that have important couplings to f wedge f or trace f wedge f. Okay, we'll see more of what, what this means as we go along. But that, that sort of raises the question, well, what, what about these things f wedge f and trace f wedge f? Do they have similar properties to f itself? And in fact, they do. So, so integral f wedge f over a four-dimensional manifold. And similarly for non-abelian groups, integral of trace f wedge f. Um, are also quantized. In fact, I think if I've normalized everything correctly, where this trace over the fundamental has a one half in it, uh, then these will both be eight pi squared times an integer. Okay, and so now what I want to do is give you some examples of, of things where these integrals are non-zero. Um, let me start with the U1 case. This one's easy, and so I'm not going to write all the details. I'm going to take my space to be a four-dimensional torus, which I can think of as two two-dimensional tori multiplied together. Okay, in other words, I have coordinates x1, x2, x3, x4. They're all periodic, like my x1 and x2 were before. And I'm going to take my field strength to be, um, how should I write it? Let me call it torus 1 times torus 2. I'm going to take my field strength to be ft1 plus ft2. What do I mean by that? I mean just take the same field strength that I defined on this two-dimensional torus that depended on x1 and x2. Call it this. Okay, so this one is proportional to dx1 wedge dx2. And then take another copy of the same thing, but relabel the variables. So call this one dx3 wedge dx4. Okay, there's some integer that went into this. So let me say this is n units of the basic thing. This is m units of the basic thing. What is f wedge f? It's n times m divided by some numbers. times all the d's, dx1, dx2, dx3, dx4. And if I integrate f wedge f over my space, I get 8 pi squared times n times m. So that's just to give you an example. Um, a field configuration on some space doesn't look a lot like the space that we live in, but it's some space where I can integrate f wedge f, get something that's not zero. It turns out this is always true. So here's a fact about mathematics. If I integrate over a four-dimensional space, again, without boundary, some closed four manifold f wedge f for a u1 gauge theory, and I divide by 8 pi squared, I get an integer. Again, if I do this for a, a, a gauge theory where my gauge group is the real numbers, I get zero. I'm not allowed to have any flux of anything. But for u1, I get an integer. Yeah. Um, why would this be true in general? That I do not have nearly enough time to prove in, in the course of these lectures. Uh, in fact, th there's a subtlety here. This, is, this, as I've stated it, is true for what are called spin manifolds. Um, a spin manifold is basically any, any manifold you can define a spinner on, which is all we care about for the real world because we have spinner fields in the real world. Um, but if you don't impose that spin part, you can actually get half integers for this thing. So 
Um, this is just a fact about mathematics. Uh, um, if you read a book about what are called characteristic classes, you will find a proof of this. And I think that's all I want to say about trying to prove it. So this was to kind of motivate that it's not unreasonable, um, but I'm not going to attempt to give you, to give you a proof. Okay, uh, so that is, that is a math fact. Yeah, question. Yeah, I'm getting to non-abelian ones in, in a minute. Yeah. Um, before I get to non-abelian gauge fields, let me uh, let me say something about physics here. Okay. So, so I've I've given you a mathematical fact. Okay. So let's talk about physics. There's a physical fact that's related to this. Um, one of these is that if I add if I add a term like this to my action, be periodic in theta. With period two pi. Where theta is already a field. Theta here is not a field. Good. So so theta is a constant. We'll get to the case where it's a field in just a second. Okay. So so this is just I'm adding what what's called a theta term to my action of my gauge theory. Um, it gives physics that's periodic in theta. Why is that? It's because my path integral depends on e to the i s. So let's say I shift the value of theta by 2 pi. What happens to my path integral? I get e to the i s plus i times 2 pi over 8 pi squared integral f. But this integral f wedge f is an integer for any field configuration in my path integral. Okay, so that's important again. The fact that our flux was quantized for any field configuration in the path integral carries over to this statement. Okay, so maybe I should write this over here. For any field configuration. Again, that means this is not a statement that relies on solving equations in motion. This is something that's true for anything you can write down. Um, and therefore, when we do this inside the path integral, we're integrating over all the field configurations. But for every single one, this thing is an integer. Um, sorry, this thing is 8 pi squared times an integer. That 8 pi squared cancels that one. We get 2 pi i times an integer inside an exponential. And that's just 1. Okay. So these theta terms, these f wedge f or ff tilde, if you're using the component notation f mu, f tilde mu nu, these terms in our, in our theories have this funny property that their coefficient is a periodic variable. Okay, so it's different from like a gauge coupling, um, which can take any value. This coupling kind of naturally lives on a circle. Okay. I should also say I'm being a little I'm being a little cavalier about Minkowski versus Euclidean. I'm kind of writing down Euclidean field configurations, and then I'm putting in this i. Really, I should probably put the i there and have a minus here to do Euclidean, but I, I don't want to get bogged down in chasing i's around. Um, the next thing to say that's that's a consequence of this is if theta is a field, if theta is like my axion field. a periodic scalar with period 2 pi. Then I could ask, what kinds of couplings am I allowed to write down? 
So consider a term in my action that's an integral of some constant times theta times f wedge f. I can write this in my action, but it's not gauge invariant. Because I said we should think of theta goes to theta plus 2 pi as a gauge transformation. It's just two different ways of labeling the same, the same thing. But our action is clearly not invariant. If I add 2 pi to theta, I add a multiple of f wedge f. That's OK. Because physics doesn't care what the action is. Physics only cares what e to the i action is. That's the only thing that ever actually shows up when you calculate a correlation function. So e to the i action goes to, again, e to the i action, e to the i times constant, shifted theta by 2 pi, so times 2 pi, integral f wedge f, which is, again, 8 pi squared times an integer. And what we conclude is this is OK if my constant is some integer over 8 pi squared. So we have learned that if I couple an axion to photons in this way, my coefficient has a well-defined normalization. It's an integer multiple of some basic unit. Again, I'm working in this funny convention where theta has period 2 pi, so it's not canonically normalized. My gauge field has charges that are integers. It's not canonically normalized. If you want to canonically normalize, you'll get an extra factor here, which we conventionally call e squared over f. I'll come back to that question. Oh, at this edge. OK, OK. So the conclusion, let me, let me just write it again. Um, the allowed couplings are integral integer over 8 pi squared periodic scalar field times f wedge f. Well, this is a statement in a particular normalization of my fields where, where theta has period 2 pi and f has quantized flux. Those statements are renormalization invariant. If you canonically normalize, your canonical normalization depends on a factor of e, which is running. And then that will show up here. Okay, but, but this statement in the normalization I'm using is well-defined and, and invariant. There can be running of E, and there can be wave function renormalization of theta. There can be, that's, that's effectively running of the decay constant F. Those are the only things that can happen. Yeah? Um, just to clarify, does this conclusion only apply for three uh, four-dimensional points? No, this, this, this holds for any four-dimensional field theory. Okay, so this is, a, this is 40 QFT. And with a U1 gauge theory, with a periodic with period 2 pi. That's kind of the full set of conditions we need. Well, we're always integrating it over, f by f can only be integrated over a four dimensional space. It's true, I only showed you an example on a torus, but the mathematical claim is that works in any space. Um, which is all we care about for, for this physics purpose. Yeah. Question about what you just said. I thought that this conclusion was for four-dimensional manifolds with some boundary. No, this is without boundary. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so these, these quantization conditions are always integrating over closed spaces that have no boundary. They, they could be like a sphere. They could be a torus. Um, but they don't have, they don't have boundaries. Explain what I mean. Um, 
So, so, so a sphere is an example. When I say a sphere, I mean the surface of a sphere, right? Um, to put a boundary in it, you would have to like cut a hole. It would have an edge somewhere. But a sphere doesn't have any edges. Okay. And same with a torus. You can. The way I've defined this torus, I, I drew it as a square with edges, but this edge is identified with that edge. So if you cross this, you come back over here. There's not any real meaningful edge. Okay. Okay. Any other questions now? No? Okay. So th this is one of the really important things I want you to take away from the lectures. Okay, so, so this is, um, as I said, there was some math that goes into this that I didn't prove to you. I'm just kind of giving you, giving you a fact. Um, but, but this is, uh, this is a uh, sharp kind of non-perturbative field theory statement that we can derive from general principles. Um, and it, it should hold in any theory. And in particular, if you just start writing down 4D axion theories, we, we will do that tomorrow. Um, we will find integers here. So it, it, it checks out when you build examples, um, but, but it's really true for a, for a deeper reason. OK. Um, OK, so, so now I want to do the non-abelian case. And I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. Uh, because qualitatively, uh, basically everything just translates immediately. And the details of the non-abelian case are a little bit easier to find in, in textbooks. Okay, so let's do the case of SUN. For SUN, our field strength is not gauge invariant, right? So I don't want to talk about a flux like an integral of F anymore because F now has an index. But trace of F wedge F. is a physical thing. It's gauge invariant. So, so the kind of first question we can ask that's analogous to what we've been doing for U1 is what is the integral of trace f wedge f over a four-dimensional space? And this, uh, at least an example, was constructed in the 70s. This is called the BPST instanton solution. So the thing I'm about to write down is a classical solution to the Young-Mills equations of motion for SU2 gauge theory um, that was constructed by Bielavin, Polyakov, Schwartz, and Tupkin, BPST. Um, and I've written more details of of a little bit more detail in the notes. Um, okay, so this is a Euclidean solution. And it depends on five parameters. We have some coordinate x naught, which is a position. somewhere in our space. And we have this parameter rho, which basically sets the size over which the field configuration is big. Okay. So there are these five parameters. Um, these parameters are variously called zero modes of the solution, or moduli, or collective coordinates of the solution. Um, I've written this as, as just a function of kind of ordinary Euclidean four-dimensional spatial coordinates. The reason I say it's a solution on S4 is that the field strength of this falls away at x goes to infinity. And so we can kind of think of making the space into a closed uh, compact space by adding the point at infinity 
where the field strength is zero. So everything kind of extrapolates there without, without any problem. Um, the solution has lots of interesting properties. It's, uh, it's self-dual, which means f mu nu is the same as f tilde mu nu. Good. That's what I haven't told you yet. <laughs> and, and it's because I don't want to write the formula because it's, it's kind of big and it'll take up space and time. Uh, this thing eta a mu nu is just some set of numbers that depend on these indices in some way. It's called the atuf symbol. You can find it in the notes. And I, I don't want to write it because it'll slow us down. OK, so, so mostly I just want you to know that this exists. And you can read about this solution in many places. Um, there's, a, there's a textbook by Misha Schiffman called Advanced Quantum Field Theory that talks a lot about instantons. There's a book by Eric Weinberg called Classical Solutions in Quantum Field Theory that also talks about instantons. Both of those books also talk about monopoles. Um, so I would recommend things that I'm kind of skipping over here. You can, you can go read more about them in, in places like that. Yeah. Uh, can we see this as like a definition of instantons? Yeah, so, so what I mean by an instanton basically um, is a solution to the Euclidean equations that's kind of localized in both space and Euclidean time. Okay, so, so the solution is kind of turned on near this point x naught and sort of falls off as you go far away from x naught. And so the reason it's called instanton, the name instanton actually didn't come from the original BPST paper. It was kind of a, a clever, funny name that Atuf came up with a bit later um, because it sort of lives at an instant in Euclidean time. It's not an ordinary particle has a world line that extends through time, uh, but this is something that lives near a particular point in time. And so it got the name instanton. Okay. Um, OK, so let me now mention two kind of key properties of the solution. The first, and maybe the most relevant for our purposes, is that if you take the solution and you integrate the trace of f by f, you get 8 pi squared. Okay. So again, this is an example of a field configuration with a non-trivial integral of f by f. It's just now it's the non-abelian case. It's the trace of f by f. Yeah. Is that an integral over all space? It is, yes. So this is an integral. Um, I guess strictly speaking, what we're, the way we're thinking about this is we're interested in integrating over kind of compact regions. So we think of taking our space and adding the point at infinity to make it a four-dimensional sphere. We kind of map this onto the four-sphere and we integrate over it. Okay, but again, this is this is a this is a four-form whose definition did not involve the metric. Okay, so this integral doesn't depend on the way we measure distances on S4. It's just a topological property of, of the fields on S4. Um, I guess kind of immediate corollaries of this are just repeating what we said already. If I add a trace f wedge f term with a constant coefficient theta, um, my physics is periodic in theta with period 2 pi if I've normalized it the way that I wrote there. And correspondingly, if I have a periodic field theta, like my axion field, um, then my allowed couplings, again, are some integer 
over 8 pi squared theta of x trace f wedge f. Actually, I skipped a step in telling you this. <laughs> I gave you an example where the integral is 8 pi squared. That, that kind of already tells you something like these things has to be true, because we can have a non-trivial integral here. Um, but in fact, again, there's a mathematical fact um, that the integral over any manifold of trace f wedge f is 8 pi squared times an integer. OK, so as with the U1 case, I'm giving you an example. And I'm just kind of asking you to take it, uh, take it as a, an assumption that this is going to be true for anything else. It's a, it's a mathematical fact. Again, uh, this is something called the second churn number of our gauge bundle. If you look in math books, you can find proofs of this fact. Yeah? What's written here? Uh, this theta over 8 pi squared has physics periodic and theta with period 2 pi. Okay. So basically, the, the quantization of this integral has the same consequences in the U1 case and in the SUN case. OK, um, property number two of the solution, which is in fact closely related because of the self-duality that tells us f and f tilde are the same, uh, the integral of f wedge f and the integral of f wedge star f are related to each other. Uh, we just have to kind of normalize carefully. And so if I take my, sorry, I don't think I want the two there uh, because of my trace. I take my classical SQ2 action minus 1 over g squared trace f wedge star f. This integral for this particular solution is 8 pi squared over g squared. This does satisfy the equations of motion. It satisfies the Euclidean equations of motion. Um, but the field value is only turned on around some particular Euclidean time, and it decays away away from that. So you just fix a time t? And then... Well, we fix, we fix this whole set of numbers x0. So it's both a, a spatial position and a Euclidean time. And then we fix a row, which sort of tells us how big the field configuration is. And this formula gives us a field configuration that lives around that point in space and time and has roughly size rho and falls away outside it. Um, not really. I mean, the, the, this is just a Euclidean solution. The Euclidean solutions do kind of have physical effects, but you sort of have to calculate how they affect something and then analytically continue back to Minkowski. So there's no, there's no object, there's no particle or, or string or any kind of dynamical thing that lives in ordinary space that you can associate with this. Um, maybe I should say the slogan that, that uh, my postdoc and collaborator John Stout likes to say, you can't eat an instanton. <laughs> an instanton, unlike a, a particle, it's not, it's not a thing that you can sort of hold and, and manipulate. OK, um, so this is a statement about the classical action. Uh, maybe one thing I should say is this, this all extends to SUN. Basically, in this definition of the ATUF symbol, A was an SU2 
adjoint index. It was like one, two, or three. And the reason that works is we're sort of mixing it up with spatial indices that are also one, two, or three. That's kind of what the symbol does. But if I have a bigger group like SUN, I can just pick out an SU2 subgroup inside SUN and build the solution inside that subgroup. And that will be a solution for the full, uh, the full theory. So all of this works for any, for any SUN. Um, and what, what this fact says, the, the action proportional to 1 over g squared means um, these are non-perturbative solutions. In particular, my, my gauge field over there was independent of g, but if I canonically normalized it, it would have a 1 over g in it. So when g is small, it's really big. And correspondingly, the action is really big. Um, but actually, we, we tend to think of non-perturbative things as things we can't calculate. But actually, these non-perturbatively big classical solutions are good for us. They, they, they are things we can calculate. Uh, because this allows a saddle point approximation in the path integral. Meaning we can study the path integral for field configurations that are kind of close to this. We have a big classical action, and then we get little quantum corrections around it from the, the fields fluctuating around this classical solution. And when g is small, that's something that's under control. OK, so this produces effects. Basically, of size e to the minus this action, our Euclidean action of our field configuration, like e to the minus 8 pi squared over g squared, which is a very small number when g is small. Yeah? Very good, very good point. Yes, so that's, that's exactly what I wanted to say next. Um, really, you should think of this g as kind of being a running coupling evaluated at the scale of the inverse size of the instanton rho. Okay, so we have these solutions for all possible sizes rho. And when rho is really a, a small length scale, QCD is weakly coupled, or, or this non-abelian gauge theory is weakly coupled at short distances. Um, and then our running coupling is small, and it's, this is a well-defined uh, contribution. And in fact, the, these field configurations are things that we should sum over in the path integral. If, I, if I'm calculating some correlation function in QCD, these are well-behaved field configurations. I, I should include them in my Euclidean path integral, and then I can analytically continue back to Minkowski. Um, and when these field configurations have small size, I can calculate their contributions, and I can use the semi-classical approximation, and everything works. This is sometimes called the dilute instanton gas approximation. We sort of sum over all these instantons that are in different places in our Euclidean space. Um, but this breaks down because the coupling runs and eventually becomes strong, as you said. Um, at, some point, at some point, our perturbation theory in QCD breaks down because G is getting big. And this instanton approximation also breaks down because our coupling is getting big. 8 pi squared over g squared is not such a big number in the exponent, so this is not exponentially small anymore. And also the kind of density of these instantons is getting big. They're sort of overlapping each other when their size gets to be of order the QCD scale. And so this, this whole approach doesn't work. Um, I think if, if you look back at, at literature from the, from the 70s when people first learned about these things, I think there was some optimism that maybe you could calculate you know, hadron physics in QCD using instantons. And it never really panned out because, because the approximation kind of breaks down at exactly the scale where you start getting into the interesting QCD dynamics. Yeah? 
Right. I guess I would say that, that there's still a sense in which you're summing over configurations that have this non-trivial topological number. They are part of your path integral. But you, yeah, OK, good. The, the, the question was, uh, so, sort of these instantons are things that sort of exist in the theory. They're like, you can think of them as some tunneling processes in the Euclidean theory. If they exist, like, why, why would it fail? And, and I guess what I would say is that at some level, they kind of exist, but our ability to calculate with them breaks down. In the same way that ordinary perturbation theory kind of breaks down, right? Like quarks and gluons in some sense are real things, but when you try to calculate a long distance process, they're not useful things anymore. And kind of the same for the, for the instantons. Um, yeah, okay, so the question was, is, is there a sense in which these instanton solutions somehow form a basis for all the solutions? Like, can you say that this is everything? Um, um, I'm not sure that we can say that. Uh, Maybe if we're looking for classical solutions with particular nice asymptotics where the fields are falling off, uh, then maybe you could try to say that those are all some sort of things like this or superpositions of things like this. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what a rigorous statement along those lines is exactly. Is that? Um, Well, these, these are not gauge equivalent. So the question was, can you think of these as all the ways of writing things that are gauge equivalent to the vacuum? Um, I guess the asymptotics of this is like that. But, but this is not gauge equivalent to the vacuum. In particular, it has a, a non-trivial field strength f that shows up in these integrals. Um, but, but yeah, certainly if you're, if you're trying to classify kinds of solutions, thinking about the asymptotics uh, in terms of these winding configurations of SU2 around, around the Spirit infinity um, is a way that people approach that that problem. Yeah. No, we we our, our space can be much bigger. But, but, but the point is that the, we, we sum over all the ways these instantons can show up. And in particular, we can have multiple instantons within the same space. And at some point, the sort of path integral measure for those instantons starts to have a lot of weight on configurations where the instantons are, are touching each other when, when their size becomes of order the QCD scale. So it's, it's really the QCD scale that's the physical scale that matters there. And I'm saying QCD, but, but what I, I set this up in just abstract non-abelian gauge theory, so, so the confinement scale more, more, more generally. OK. Um, Yeah, thanks. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, did everybody hear that? Yeah, OK. So, so, so in particular, let, let, let me say that this, this statement about these integrals being integers, that's true for any field configuration, whether it's a classical solution or not. Um, and and, and so, so that's a robust thing. And that, that's the main thing I'm going to be using in, in our axion physics. OK, so I don't, I don't want to get too hung up on the instantons. Um, yeah. G is dimensionless here, yeah. Okay, so uh, up there is the action dimensionless? The action is dimensionless, yes, because e to the i action shows up in the path integral, so it had better be a dimensionless thing. Rho looks like a dimensionless parameter. Rho has units of length, yes. Th this, is eight, this is e to the minus 8 pi squared over g squared parentheses rho inverse. This is the running coupling evaluated at the scale. 
row inverse. Yeah, not multiplied by. Yeah. Um, so because all of this is done in the Euclidean framework, um, can we in some way like do these arguments transform into Minkowski space? Um, like what? Like in terms of thinking about Pino and relating this to. Well, certainly the, the kinds of constraints we derive on like what our action is allowed to be, like um, like the statement that if I have a periodic scalar, I can only couple it to gauge fields with this integer multiple, that's sort of a constraint on the action that's going to carry over from Euclidean to Minkowski. Okay, so, so we can use the Euclidean theory to deduce things that we can then apply in the theory in real time. Another question. Yeah. I'm just using the instanton mostly as an illustration of a field that has this non-trivial topology. Um, but but it is true that instantons are useful in certain regimes for certain things. But but I don't I don't want to overemphasize it. Just like my flux on the torus, I don't want you to think there's anything special about this four-dimensional torus. It was just an example of a field with non-trivial topology, so is this. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> that, that sounds good. Um, okay, because I do have one more topic I wanna talk about, and, and this is a topic that I think is hopefully more familiar. In particular, this is something where the standard QFT textbooks do a decent job. Um, which is the chiral anomaly. In particular, I'm going to, to show you what's called the ABJ anomaly. And let me say, um, Peskin and Schroeder sections 19.1 to 19.4, kind of calculate this in a few different ways with different regulators, and, and if you haven't worked through it, um, I strongly encourage you to spend some time going through that. Um, I'm just going to kind of summarize the, the final conclusions, but, but not give you the detailed calculations. So let's look at a theory with a Lagrangian, where we have a U1 gauge field, And two fermions, these are left-handed vial fermions. One of them is named psi, the other is named psi bar. The bar is part of the name. Don't confuse it with a conjugate. Psi has charge one, psi bar has charge minus one. Okay, so if I didn't have the gauge field, I would have two global symmetries, because I would just have two different free fermions. And I could talk about a symmetry where I change the phase of psi, or I could talk about a symmetry where I change the phase of psi bar. And what we have done with the gauge field is to gauge one combination of those two global symmetries, which is the combination in the notation I have here where alpha and beta are the same. But you can say, well, we started out with two global symmetries. We gauged one. We should have one left. Okay, and so any combination that's not the one we gauged, we could think of as being a remaining global symmetry. So after gauging, you would say, I could still talk about a symmetry where I rotate the phase of, say, psi, and I do nothing to psi bar. That's different than the combination I gauge, so that should be a global symmetry. It's certainly a global symmetry of my Lagrangian. If I take my Lagrangian and I do that operation, I don't change anything. It is, however, not a global symmetry of the quantum theory. 
and there are kind of two classic ways of deriving this. Okay, so we have our we have a current for this symmetry, um, which looks something like this. Basically, psi dagger sigma mu psi. This current creates a fermion and an antifermion. So I can imagine calculating some correlation function where I insert this at some point. And it makes the fermion an antifermion. And then there's a class of diagrams where I close up those fermions into a loop and attach two photon lines. And there are really two distinct such diagrams uh, where I either change the direction of the arrows in the loop or cross the photons over. And so I could use this to calculate some correlation functions of my current. And then I can ask, do those correlation functions obey the Ward identity that tells me the current is conserved? Okay. And this is what uh, um, ABJ, Adler, Bell, and Jakiv did. They showed that, in fact, you do not have a symmetry. Because when you do these calculations carefully, you find that your current has a divergence that looks something like this. Divergence of your current involves two field strengths contracted with an anti-symmetric epsilon symbol. Um, another way to write this I told you currents should really be thought of as three forms. So we have a capital J chiral, which is the three form Hodge dual to this. And this is telling us that D of that is something like minus one over eight pi squared times the four form F wedge F. Okay. So So our current is not conserved, which means our symmetry is not a symmetry. It's a symmetry of the classical Lagrangian, but once we do a loop calculation, we're working in the quantum theory, and we learn that it's not a symmetry of the quantum theory. Okay. There is another way to talk about this in terms of the path integral. This was derived by Fujikawa. He said, well, I have, I have a definition of my theory where what I'm doing is I'm doing a path integral over all of my fields of some e to the i action. The fact that this operation I did is a classical symmetry means it doesn't change e to the i action by definition. That's how we checked that this was a classical symmetry. It didn't change our Lagrangian. Sorry, it doesn't change action. So if this is not going to be a symmetry of our quantum theory, what could be happening? Well, it must be that it's changing this. And that's exactly what, what Fujikawa showed. Um, in fact, we could even put in space-time dependence e to the i alpha of x, psi of x. If I rephase my fermion field 
my path integral measure for the fermion turns into what it was before times a new term that looks like e to the minus i alpha over eight, sorry, e to the minus i over eight pi squared integral alpha f wedge f. Which you can convince yourself is equivalent to that other statement. Okay, so um, let's see. I'm just about out of time for today. A couple more minutes. So, so this this version of the statement will be really useful for us when we talk about axions, because what we're going to do is we're going to build models where there's some uh, coupling of some field, some Goldstone field, to fermions. And what we can do is use field redefinitions to kind of move that around. So I can change my fermion by rephasing it in a way that's going to depend. Then this alpha won't be some abstract thing. It will be our actual value of the axion field. And if we rephase our fermions, that's going to pop up as a new coupling of the axion to our gauge fields. Okay, so in tomorrow's lecture, we'll be using this over and over again. But for now, I'm just telling you the answer. And the reason that I haven't tried to derive this for you Partly it's just lack of time, partly it's that these derivations are kind of finicky. Um, if you naively write down these loop diagrams and try to add them together, you might at first think they add up to zero. And they don't, but to see they don't, you have to regulate them and be really careful about it, and then at the end take the regulator away. Um, same thing here. To define this measure, you have to kind of write down a basis of, of fields psi, and, and write your measure as a product of things in that basis. That's an infinite product. You have to regulate it. Um, and if you're careful about it, then this in the end pops out. But these derivations, they, they have a lot of these picky little details you have to get right if, if you want to, to get the right answer. So again, uh, you can read about it. A lot of the standard textbooks cover it. Um, I, I read through the derivation of Peskin and Schroeder again the other day. I think, I think they do a nice job of explaining how the regulators work and doing everything carefully. Um, yeah, so, so at this point, I think we have all the kind of formal ingredients, and next time we're ready to dive right in to strong CP and axions. Um, in the last maybe minute, are, are there any other questions about what I've said? That, I think, is also in Peskin and Schroeder. Yeah. There's also, you, you can just look for Fujikawa on Inspire and find his original paper also. Yeah. Uh huh. Um. What's the way to say it best? Um, I guess what, what, what this formula tells us is that, is that the symmetry is only violated in the presence of these electromagnetic fields. Okay, so, so in a background where the fields are turned off, there's no symmetry violation. Um, and so there are probably lots of different correlation functions you could compute that would show this to you, but this is the easiest one. That, that involves both the current that we're interested in and the background fields that turn out to exist on the right-hand side. Maybe one other remark to make. This is called an ABJ anomaly. If I didn't have a gauge field here, if I just had these two free fermions, we would have a theory with an honest U1 times U1 symmetry where we rotate them independently. But that whole U1 times U1 cannot be gauged because we've seen that if we gauge part of it, then part of it becomes not a symmetry anymore and we can't gauge that. That's called an Atuft anomaly. Okay, so it's a subtle distinction. An Atuft anomaly is when you have an actual global symmetry of your theory, but you can't gauge it. An ABJ anomaly is when you have a classical symmetry that is not a symmetry of the quantum theory. But we see here that in this case, they're very closely related to each other. Okay, the, the Atuft anomaly is kind of a precursor of the ABJ anomaly, which then appears once we gauge part of the symmetry. Uh, yeah, so, so the Tuft anomaly you could calculate in the same way, where instead of thinking of these as 
dynamical gauge fields, you either think of them as just some kind of classical background field that, that this is happening in, or you think of them as currents of the, of the vector symmetry that we gauged. Exactly. So, 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 right. So, so, these things are total derivatives, and so in perturbation theory, uh, adding terms involving f wedge f to your action doesn't do anything. Uh, but non-perturbatively, they have effects because of these kinds of topologically non-trivial field configurations we talked about. But also, um, when you have a scalar coupled to them, even in perturbation theory, this has an effect. So, if this theta, if, if this alpha I wrote was a dynamical scalar then like that scalar could decay to photons. That's something that you can get directly from this, and that's because once I put this here, the whole thing is not a total derivative anymore. I was wondering if there was some sort of generalized Gaussian theorem that could be applied to things with boundary at all, and if if so, where I could read read about that. I don't think I know the answer to that. Okay. Um, it's it seems yeah. very much not in the literature. Yeah. Um, or I mean, a, a lot of these things. If you if you let me turn off.